Welcome into the show, Jesse Murph. How are you, Jess? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thanks for coming. You played last night. How did that feel? Baby's all right in Brooklyn? So much fun. Awesome. It was good crap. And tonight you're actually at the Mercury Lounge. It must be amazing for you when you see the whole entire audience singing these songs back to you. You just released the record like February 10th. Yeah, it's and surreal. It, surreal. And also like another thing that's surreal, 100 million streams in something like less than a month, which is also incredibly surreal. That's so insane. <laughs> insane. When you think about wow. the magnitude of that, right? Yeah. So talk to him about it. I want to kind of take it back just all the way to the beginning for you. Tell me about how you grew up, you know, the music that was around you. What made you fall in love with music at an early age? Yeah, I grew up um, in Alabama. I was born in Nashville, and I moved to Alabama at a young age. And I grew up in a pretty, like, musical household, so it was just always around me. Um, Both your parents were singers, right? Yeah, yeah. My dad sang, like, country music, and my mom did like alternative so no not professionally they just sang just to yeah not really professionally and growing up would you at, at what point were you like you know i think music is definitely something that i need to do because i know that you were manifesting this in your journals at like 11 years old yeah i was i i've just always wanted to do it since as little as i can remember there was a span when i was like i think 11 nah not 11 i was in sixth grade it's like 14 i wanted to be a lawyer for like a month <laughs> and then I was like, no, I'm not going to be a singer. Because <laughs> initially, it's interesting. You grew up in a very conservative city, right? A real small town. Yeah. And talk to me about all the musical influences you had and what people were listening to growing up around you and, and where it was like clicking for you where you're like, because you did a lot of sports growing up and kind of talk to me about, you know, your upbringing and, and what it was like growing up where you did. Yeah. Musically, um, where I lived, I feel like everybody listened to a lot of country, obviously, um, but also a lot of hip hop, like a lot of my friends we listen to hip hop um, and a mix of country too. So I feel like you can kind of hear that in my music, but yeah, it definitely has influenced my sound. So. And were your parents kind of pushing you to do music at an early age or did they say, you know, stay in school? Cause I think you were into, didn't you do track and gymnastics and things like that at an early age? I did. I did track, cheer, figure skating and some other things here and there, but <laughs> no, my parents were never like pushing me to do it. They they always supported me, but they weren't like, do it. It was very much a me-initiated thing. Because so. I heard the story, you went to like a Rascal Flats concert or something. You sat all the way on the top, and you're like, okay, this is what I need to do, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a moment where I was like, fuck, I'm, I'm going to do that. That's when the manifesting, I feel like, really started happening. Was that at 11? Because it's strange to be 11 and like manifest what you're doing and know <laughs> at that young age already what you want to do with the rest of your life. At 11, I don't think I knew what the hell I was doing. So Yeah, I think it was around that age, I'd say. I just, yeah, it was such a powerful feeling. And then the journals was a very real thing. I journaled a lot about it. And I would actually like write myself contracts and make me sign them. Amazing. Do you ever <laughs> look back in those journals and just kind of kind of read them and think about what you were manifesting at that age? I do. I do. Um, one of them's like put up on a wall in my room. So Amazing. Yeah. Is it is it possible that I saw like a Black Sabbath record cover on your wall or was that not your wall? I definitely saw you, you probably, doing a video. You probably did. Yeah. I had like a lot of records just on my wall um, and they came from my grandparents' house. But I will admit I haven't heard a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's amazing because you grew up in this really conservative culture and, and a real small town, as we were saying. And, and I know early on you started posting a lot of things on YouTube and then eventually TikTok and just kind of, I mean, we can curse on the show, so not give okay, a fuck great. about that. <laughs> Basically about what you were saying. And, and uh, you know, obviously I think cussing where you're from was sort of looked down upon. And I think, it, I don't know if it was your parents or I don't know if it was your school that sat you down and said, you know, just you really gotta you can't be doing this because if you're gonna do this we're gonna make you run like four miles for every word you say or something yeah which at that point i probably would have said i'm gonna stop cursing because <laughs> i'm not that good at track so <laughs> <laughs> yeah dude um it was actually cheer that would make me run because they were like you have to be like have a good image or whatever the fuck that means but um yeah they would tell me i needed to act like a lady Mm. But they were fine with like the dudes cussing and like half the football team smoked weed and shit. Yeah. Um, and what does that even mean, by the way? Because it's, you know, these stereotypes about what's OK ridiculous. and what's not OK. It is. Yeah, it's ridiculous. But I think them saying that made me want to do it even more, yeah. obviously. 
I was like, fuck it, I'll run. <laughs> <laughs> Every day for the rest of my life. Oh. Were you bullied a lot in school growing up? I wasn't bullied by kids. It was like the parents. Mm. And my parents or my mom got it pretty heavily about like, look at what she's letting her daughter pose. Look at what her daughter's singing or like singing these songs and shit. But it didn't, it was never really like kids, which is good. Mm. How old were you when you started posting things on YouTube and eventually TikTok? Well, 11, but I started posting on TikTok at like 14 or 15. Mm. Yeah. And I imagine you wouldn't change it for the world, right? The whole trajectory and how you started and you start posting things and all of a sudden the parents and obviously the cheer team and everyone around you was like, you know what? You can't be doing this. So did that kind of push you to want to do it more and just succeed as an art? Even I, I say as an artist, because again, at 12, 13, you're probably not thinking, all right, I'm going to be an artist. You're just singing and doing what comes natural to you at that age, right? Yeah, it definitely motivated me. A hundred percent it motivated me. And back to the thing about like the parents and kids and like bullying and shit it it did kind of like start with the kids once I started putting out my own music Mm. they'd be like this is horrible or like stick to stick to like cheer or something like that (laughs) um it's interesting how those kind of things kind of drive you sometimes right because 100 percent. yeah I mean it's uh I think growing up you, you know you probably had a lot of idols. I'm sure it was people like when I listen to music, I can hear bits of like Amy Winehouse and Lana Del Rey and Billy Idol, uh, Billy Idol, sorry, not Billy <laughs> But who were your idols growing up really? T- you know, cause I know you had a, a you, we talked about hip hop too a little bit, right? So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start off with Adele. I think that she's incredible. I, if I could pick one artist to listen to for the rest of my life, it'd be her. Great choice. Also black or six leg. I'm super inspired by him little baby and then like lady a love them mm. cheryl crow amy winehouse a bunch of different people yeah but oh rihanna too yeah. amazing it's interesting because when you talk about your career trajectory and how you started and how music is made now again a lot of it started on social media i was just watching this uh tv show that came out today uh daisy jones and the six it's about a band in the 70s kind of patterned after fleetwood mac back then in the day they get together in a room they write music and you know, they could practice for years before ever going out and playing a gig. So it's interesting to hear that early on you started posting things, right? You started getting feedback. And even initially, your first song, I think your first original, you posted online and you were like, you were kind of waiting for feedback, I think, until you really decided to release and go forward. So it's so fascinating how music is created these these days. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd say that the feedback thing is definitely very prominent. Even now, still, it's like, I love to see people's reactions and shit when I post songs because it's beautiful when I connect to something I wrote, obviously, but it's crazy when a lot of people connect mm. to it. And that's kind of how I release music. I'd well, how, say. Well, how about 11 million people connecting to that? That's a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and so tell me about how you use tools like that to decide. Cause even I, again, I've heard stories that like you had producers kind of sliding into your DMS and, that's how you were connecting with the people that you ended up doing music with. So would you put songs out initially and just see, you know what, if people are taking to this and they seem like there's a, some positive feedback here, that's kind of the direction that I want to head in because the covers obviously did very well for you early mm-hmm. on, right? Yeah, I didn't actually. I put out one song before I got signed. Um, so I put that out and then people started reaching out. But even before then, I had posted like a bunch of originals um, and like producers and stuff would DM me based off of that so yeah it's kind of how that started and you had people like luke combs that kind of started following you and you said all right something's <laughs> happening here right yeah. yeah that was actually like last week and i right. really i did freak out yeah <laughs> i love luke combs dude <laughs> anybody else that started following you started really resonating with your music that you felt you know what something i'm doing is really working here for this and for me yeah russ followed me the other day too i freaked out about that as well amazing but yeah a couple people it's just it's crazy to see people that i look up to and respect as artists follow me i don't know yeah so talk to me about again sign the the you know the the timeline here you start putting music out it's on youtube tiktok some of the covers start really resonating and then eventually you know we'll, we'll talk about leading up to your deal now with columbia records how did that all happen for you how did it all happen mm, i think consistency definitely on social media and because at certain points certain things went viral for you right yeah, definitely. Um, 
I also think it has a lot to do with the songs and just like stuff I've been through. And anytime I think about, well, damn, I wish I wouldn't have gone through that or I wish this wouldn't have happened. I, I don't. I don't regret anything that's ever happened because all of the music, all of the emotions and feelings that I've put into that wouldn't the songs wouldn't exist mm. and we wouldn't be sitting here right now so, so yeah i think it's owed a lot to that so how did it come to be from putting covers and you know and things like tiktok and then the songs that went viral to eventually you doing an upgrade and you landing this deal with columbia records because it's a lot of people have things that go viral but to get a deal with you know columbia records especially we were just chatting for a moment about how hot that label is it's everyone right adele as we were talking mm-hmm. about harry styles Miley cyrus it's one of the hottest and adam alpert who has disrupted records with you, uh, incredibly hot executives, and, and the music you know, that you're doing is really resonating with people. So how did that whole, you know, how did it happen for you? Um, I think just, yeah, being consistent with writing and songs and not taking your foot off of the gas. And I think a large part of it is owed to people that relate to your music, you know? Mm. Because it wouldn't matter if I was putting out all of these songs if people weren't going through the same things, you know. So. So was it? So did like Adam reach out to you on? Was it a DM and he said, "Hey, I love what you're doing. We'd love to take a meeting." Did you uh, have a manager early on? I didn't. I think I did have a manager before I got signed, maybe for a little bit. Um, and how'd you meet the manager? How did it all happen for you? I think you? they just slid into the DMs. And said, I love what you're doing. Let's connect. I'm pretty sure, yeah. yeah. During that time, I was 16, so my mom handled a lot of yeah. that stuff. <laughs> right, of course. Um, but yeah. So eventually, you get to show, do you showcase for Columbia Records? Or do you just get a deal without doing any live performances? I think I just got a deal without doing the live performances. Amazing. Because it was so during COVID-ish. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Which every, everything was shut down. The whole world was in a... But in a way, I guess it helped you sort of... You had some time to really work on your craft and test out what was resonating with your audience, right? And at that point, did you have an audience of a couple million on TikTok or was it just starting to happen for you? I think when I got signed, I had about three million probably. Um, so yeah, but I had never performed live when I got signed. So that was something that happened later on. So eventually you write this great song, Upgrade, mm-hmm. and do you test it out with your audience and uh, just to see what the response is? Yeah, I actually just like made up a chorus, and I played it for TikTok. I didn't even record it or anything, and then I was on a ski trip, and it was like blowing up, so I had to like record it on my phone. The one that's released is actually recorded on an iPhone. Amazing. Which is random. You had to get off the slopes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said, you know what? This is definitely happening for me now. So, are there some challenges along the way for an artist like yourself, Jess, when you're just getting into it and starting? And again, you're kind of finding your way from covers to writing music. And I'm sure you're working with a lot of different writers now. You probably do things like writing camps just to kind of figure out who you're working with and which producers. Are there any producers you work with that really kind of, I think that you really collaborate with that you really love? Yeah, I think there's a lot of. Um I think there's a lot of difficulties with moving from doing covers to doing your own music. Yeah. Um, especially with like following, like right when I started putting my own music on TikTok and kind of stopped covers, I lost a lot of followers. Mm. Um, and that was something that I had to like mentally push through without getting like distur- discouraged because in the end, obviously it ended up being the right move. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's something I had to deal with. And then writer wise, there's a lot of people that I work with um a lot <laughs> so it's funny because you were posting covers and, and your audience was like you know what if you're not going to keep doing those we're going to unfollow you yeah not a lot of people but like i just noticed like some people were unfollowing me i was like i mean it's discouraging but then i did push through and i ended up i'm at like 8.8 million now so incredible well your yeah. voice is incredible thank you you just dropped this new mixtape slash record so let's talk about it and talk about some of the songs on the record because there's some heavy subjects, right? And mm-hmm. I think uh, when you talk about things like, you know, you're talking about sobriety and you're talking about like losing a friend and, and a lot of anxiety and, and I, I think you're a huge advocate for mental health. So let's talk about such, an, you know, important subjects because at the end of the day, you're young, so it's it, these are heavy subjects to talk about. But I think it's important that you're, I think you're educating people and if you could help some people along the way, I think that's the most important thing, right? Agreed, agreed. I think that a lot of that has been 
it's not me like i want this to be talked about more i want it's genuinely just me going through things and i use music as an outlet and then i share it and mm. people are like oh shit i'm going through that too or i feel that too so that's kind of how that happens <laughs> but but ultimately like i think mental health is something that you speak about a lot right and so yeah. there's got to be stories that people come up to you and say you know what jess your music changed my life like any great stories that you can remember when you when fans have approached you and said you know you really helped me through some dark times all the time it happens it happens a lot a lot especially since like starting touring and stuff i remember this one time this mom came up to me with her daughter and they were both crying and the mom was like my daughter wouldn't be here today without you and i just started crying because i was like that's i hear stuff like that a lot but just to see the emotion Mm. right there in front of me and to like that's a heavy thing to hear i think it is it's it's, but it's also beautiful um i'm super grateful yeah i mean how important is it for you as an artist to address mental health I mean, like I said earlier, it wasn't something that I was like, I'm going to write this so we can all come together about it. Like, it was genuinely... Organic. It was me struggling. Yeah. yeah. And then everybody... It's honestly helped me feel less alone Mm. because just knowing that a lot of people go through that type of stuff. It's funny because they say music is the great healer. So in the end, I guess that it really has helped. But let's talk about the songwriting process for this record and kind of how the record came to be. Like I said, all, some of these songs already have 100 million <laughs> streams, which again, when you think about it, it's only been out like not even a month, right? So yeah. it's obviously resonating with people, right? So walk me through the process on this new record, because I think you made it in a, you were saying you made this in a studio in Alabama that was like prehistoric or something. <laughs> it, it was like an old studio that nobody was using. So, yeah. so how did the record come to be? And, and, and walk me through some of the songs on the record. Yeah, I mean, it came to be, I did some of them in that studio in Alabama you're talking about, but I also traveled a lot making this. I did a lot in Nashville. I did a lot in LA. Um, And over the course of about a year and a half, it wasn't, it wasn't like a camp or anything. Mm. And it's also, I feel like you can hear me growing up throughout the project because there's some songs that I made when I was like 16 and then there's some from like 18 year old me now. So it's it shows a lot of my growth as a person and yeah it was all inspired by like one relationship still this is a relationship you currently have a relationship you had that you were writing about yeah (laughs) okay and because we'll talk about kind of song by song there's a lot of great drafts on the record so let's talk about how could you right one of the you know a great song on the record and i think if you listen to the lyrics that you talk about set it on fire just walk away so i can feel anything else but this weight so let's talk about the, the lyrics lyrically like where are you pulling from this inspiration from yeah this is one that i haven't really talked about with anybody because i'm not it's not something that i think i'm comfortable talking about mm. and that's why this song is here because if i was comfortable talking about what i wrote it about i would have just talked about yeah. it instead of writing that song and i think that's why if you listen to it you can hear how painful and like how much emotion is in it because it is it's a really heavy song and i also feel like it does a good job of like explaining what the song's about it's deeply personal yeah very and, and personal. another incredibly personal song what happened to ryan which you have spoken about it's, it's actually about a friend of yours that you lost to addiction yeah it just it's about that but it's also about watching somebody you love just like really struggle um, and I've, I've seen that a lot in my life with different people. And I, I feel like there's a lot of songs about people going through that, mm. but there's not enough songs of your loved ones, like watching you go through that because that's a hard place to be as well. It's funny, you know, there's a lot of positives and negatives to social media, but I think one of the good things about it is that there is this transparency now and there's, you know, the ability to help people when people are struggling. And I feel like when you're a songwriter and you're writing songs like this, like we spoke about, you're really helping people because then people get on TikTok and they're talking about their experiences. And sometimes people are oversharing on those things. <laughs> and it's like, it's always funny when you know, I look at it. It's like, I went on a date last night. It's like, I don't know if everybody wants to talk about that. <laughs> but ultimately, I think the good that comes out of it is to be able to help people. So again, just losing this friend that of yours that you had, Ryan, I mean, talk to me about how deeply personal this is to you and, and the fact that I feel like this is going to resonate with a lot, and it is resonating with a ton of people at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to be in that situation because 
there's a certain part of you that like well for for me it was like you party with these people you're having fun with these people and you don't want to be the person to be like okay that's too much like you're doing too much you don't want to be that person but it also sucks to look back on shit and be like damn i should have I should have said something. Yeah, and it's so hard to lose someone at your age because they have their whole life ahead of you. So do you guys talk about it? Do you have a friend group that you get together and you talk about what happened? Or is it just you sort of internalize it? Yeah, well, this friend that you're talking about didn't... She's not dead. Okay. Yeah, she's alive. Okay, (laughs) she was just struggling with addiction. This is sort of... But did she get help eventually? Yeah, she yeah, she okay. went to rehab, okay. um, and she's actually doing better now. Okay, well, so. thank God she's still here. Yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I should have. I feel like it's kind of, the song leaves it unclear, because yeah. it is, I mean, it goes either way for some people. Yeah, so. and like I said, a lot of, uh, do you, I mean, do you feel like when you're writing things, is it, are you ever thinking, you know, I need to write a song that's sort of happy, or you do you resonate more with the things that are sort of dark or pop and if you have to listen to artists like Billie Eilish and artists like Lana, a lot of them are, they get real deep and real personal. W- what yeah. kind of works for you as an artist? Well, personally, like when I make, if I ever make any type of happy music, I'm like, this shit, it doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> right. Like, so what is it the doing? The darker the better, right. <laughs> um, so I'd rather just talk about struggles and shit. But it, d- it does get hard when I'm doing good. Yeah. It gets hard to write for me. So that's something I've struggled with. Because you got to be on a bit of a high now. The tour is sold out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Every night sold out. Kids are singing back every lyric of the songs to you, and you just released the record. So it, I guess for your next record, maybe it's not going to be happy, but there's a chance <laughs> it could be happy. <laughs> it's definitely some of the newer stuff I've been making is less heavy, yeah, which is good for my personal well-being. But yeah, sometimes I'm like, damn, is this as good? Just because it's not as painful which is weird yeah i mean even songs like drunk in the bathtub right it's yeah. again i heard that you were having like this emo moments right <laughs> so what, what was going on with that song and and the, and the story behind that song um yeah that's that's a pretty heavy one i that was one of the only songs on this record that i i feel like a lot of it was almost like freestyled like i just i was it was i was in a really bad place and i came into the studio and was just like it just came out um so a lot of that song is just very real um but yeah that was not a good era for me <laughs> well the next record is gonna be really happy because the tour is sold out and, and you're doing so well. but we'll interesting see. enough when you write a song like that do you bring in the lyrics do you bring in the melody are you working with a producer who's bringing you the music uh, what's the process like for you well i like to work with producers that know how to play instruments mm. i don't like to like i don't like it when people like will pull up a beat or something i i need them to like play chords and build it from scratch because you play yourself too. Yeah, I dabble. Yeah. Um, dabble. <laughs> but I'm always very heavily involved in the writing process when it comes to sessions. I don't really bring stuff in. I'll just bring that emotion in and they'll start playing chords and I'll kind of just start singing stuff. So for this record in particular, was it that you came in just again, you know, with the lyrics and the melody and then music was already created for you? Not always, no. I don't come in with lyrics or melody, actually. I just come in as me. And then <laughs> and, you, and you create in the studio. I create in the studio. Yeah. yeah. I like it that way. Do you find that your best work happens spontaneously, or is it like we were speaking about right before we started? There are songs that people work on, and songs that are, number one, <laughs> that people work on for a year, year and a half. For you, your, is your best inspiration spontaneous, would you say? A hundred percent spontaneous. I I actually hate working on songs for more <laughs> right. than like... I get so, it's also I'm very, this might be just because I'm young and I'm not a very patient person, (laughs) but if I write a song like two months ago and it's great and we still haven't put it out. It's old for you already. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to, they're going to be like, let's put this out. I'm going to be like, I hate that song. You're writing songs on the ski slopes. Yeah. Cause I'm not (laughs) going through that anymore. So I don't want to hear it. Now are you writing on the road now? Cause you just started this tour, which is selling out everywhere. Um, I haven't really written on the road. I had. I like write stuff in my notes for when I do have a session, but I don't have a way to record, I guess. So mm. not really. And tell me about an artist for like yourself, Jess, that's just kind of now, you know, things are happening for you. You're selling out this tour everywhere. What's daily like, like for you on tour? I'm not going to lie to you. It's been exhausting. Yeah. Um, I have had to like really try and preserve my emotional, battery i guess Mm. because like you said these songs are heavy and singing them every night and then people coming up to me and telling me their stories which i love to hear 
Um, it's a lot of heavy stuff, so I've really had to like preserve my emotional battery. But I feel like you have this great connection with your fans, too. Yeah. You feel like you ever need to put a barrier between yourself and the fans? Because I'm sure after every show they want to meet you and take pictures, or do you come right out and take pictures with everyone and hear yeah. the stories? Yeah, yeah, I love doing that. It's yeah. it's a highlight of my night. I love meeting everybody. Um, but, yeah, sometimes it is definitely hard, especially, like, no, I think nothing is worse than having a show. And, like, I haven't really had this yet, thank God, but having a show and performing these type of songs and people like if they weren't into it i guess like if they were talking during like fucking how could you or something that shit is very it just feels horrible yeah so but i have my fans i don't even like calling them fans i feel like they're like family at this point but i have the most wonderful friends slash family. You, got 11, <laughs> you got 11 million of them and, and counting i'm sure yeah. but do you have sort of a daily ritual like on a show day where you're like you know these two hours i'm gonna reserve my energy for myself because i am getting to some heavy things and i want to be really present in the moment when i perform no i should and that's probably something i should look into yeah. um, i tried to meditate once it wasn't for me because i would like do it and people would be talking around me because i <laughs> try and do it in somewhat public places but it's just it's hard to get into that space yeah. sometimes doing that know? in public's crazy yeah man. i mean I, it didn't work <laughs> for me but i guess you got to do it at your house or something but so you don't have any sort of rituals that you use to get ready for a show do you warm up at all or you just go out there and because your oh, voice yeah. is incredible so i Thank feel like you. if you don't it, it's in at the end of the day it, it really is like that's your instrument right so if you don't take care of it especially on the road it, it, it's hard so that's true yeah yeah i mean i definitely warm up especially right now my voice is very it's struggling right now mm. We've been doing a lot of shows back to back. Um, it's just a crammed spot of the tour, but it's going to space out a little bit after this, I think. Because um, this tour goes all the way, I think, to May, and you're playing some big festivals, w- which you got to be excited about. At the I'm end of the tour. so excited! Yeah. I love festivals; they're my favorite. They're so much fun. Um, but this tour ends in April, in so April. That's and then, good. but there are a few dates. I think I think I saw in May. Maybe there was like a Post Malone festival. Or, uh, there was some festival at the end that I. Yeah, there's definitely some festivals in May. I think even one in April too. Yeah. So. Which ones are you the most excited about? I'm playing Lollapalooza, which amazing. I've heard a lot about. You've never been. I've never been. Yeah. Um, I'm really excited about that. There's a lot of us. Oh, Hangout Festival. It's in Alabama. Yeah. So I've never been to that either randomly, but I'm super excited. So if someone comes to a Jesse Murph show, obviously you do some covers too, right? Yeah. There's certain covers that, you, you know, are still so near and dear to your heart after performing some of them for a couple of years there. So which ones are they going to hear if they come to see you play? Well, I actually change it up a lot because I do get very bored. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Before He Cheats by Carrie Underwood has been a staple for me. That's your favorite, right? I fucking love that one. <laughs> yeah. And then Stay by Rihanna. Such a good Another song. Another great song. Yeah. So tell me about how you think you've evolved as an artist, right? Because you've only been doing this for a couple of years, which again, when we think about it, it is pretty astounding. I mean, sometimes you just think about those numbers, right? A million people in itself is a huge number. But when you think about like 100 million people that are downloading your songs... It's got to make you happy. And as I said, the next record is going to be all happy pop, I'm sure, and <laughs> because things are going great. So, uh, <laughs> but y- y- it's it's got to feel good for you, I would imagine, right? Yeah. No, it definitely feels good. It's it's honestly crazy. And back to the manifesting thing, just I truly believe in manifestation and just seeing what your brain is capable of is crazy to me. Yeah. Do you see your evolution as an artist in the last couple of years? Like, what do you, how do you feel like you've evolved? 100%. I think. The whole town thing made me push away, um, like, the country parts of me. Mm. And they're starting to come back out because I feel like I've healed from that. And I'm grateful for that, um, that whole where I grew up and everything. Um, but so a lot of the country influences are coming back. And you can hear it in my music, which I think is beautiful. And, yeah, I feel like that's the biggest part of the evolution that's been happening well, I love the fact that now it's sort of about defying genres, right? So if you listen to some of your stuff, you can definitely hear the hip hop influences, right? And yeah. so early on, I probably didn't hear that as much as I do now, but it's so cool and so great to hear every artist now defying any kind of genres because that's what it's all about in the end, right? It's just about doing what makes you feel good. So I feel Agreed. like hip hop is playing a big role in what you're doing now too. I feel like you're, I think I heard you talk about if you had any dream collaborator, it would probably be Little Baby. You still mm-hmm. feel like that? Yeah, no, he's 100%. behind door number two. We're gonna bring him now. <laughs> <laughs> so, but would you feel like is that sort of someone that you feel like you you would definitely want to collaborate with? A hundred percent. Yeah, all day long. I love him. I've listened to him 
for a long time. So maybe Little Baby and Adele would be Jesse's like dream collaboration team there. Yeah. Hmm. That's actually a good question. I don't know if Adele is somebody that I would. I don't even think she needs collaborators, yeah. bro. She's just Adele, dude. But you never know. People are doing, there's so many interesting things that are going on in music, right? There's so True. many artists that are, sometimes you, you hear like Ed Sheeran performing with like a metal band now and you're like, that should have worked. I think he's rapping now. Yeah. Which is <laughs> fire. Go Ed, But bro. But, it, you know, <laughs> sometimes it works. Yeah. Awesome. So we do this fun thing, Jess, at the end of the show, and people seem to really like this. Okay. So tell me your top five singers ever for you. Oh, this is hard. Okay. I'm going to start with Adele. Oh, okay. Adele. She's number five. Who, oh, we're going five to one? We'll go five to one. That's number hard. five is? number. I'm going to have to start with one. Is that okay? Okay, let's start with number one. Okay, I'm going to start with Adele. Then I'm going to go, I got to say Drake. Then I gotta say Rihanna. Then I gotta say Lil Baby. What number am I at? You're at four. Oh fuck. Hmm. It's between Black and Amy Winehouse. All great <laughs> choices. I thought Carrie Underwood might have made a list, but uh, she's great too. <laughs> she's great too. And the top five concerts you've ever seen. Okay, I really haven't seen a lot of concerts. But I've definitely seen five. So I saw Jack Harlow, which is great. Um, I saw Billy. Incredible as well. I don't know, man. Oh, the Rascal Flats were crazy. That was your first concert. It's my first concert. Yeah. Okay. I got two more. You got two more. I really haven't seen that many concerts. Um, I saw Paulo G. It was cool. Okay. <laughs> uh, and we got one more to go. One more. I'm trying to think. Oh, Post Malone. Yeah. There we go. Fire. Which one was number one for you? Rascal Flats. Because that was your first concert ever. So, yeah, I yeah. got to put them on top. <laughs> yeah. I've heard you said this great quote, and I love this quote that you say, don't try and fit in if you can be different. Yeah. So talk about that for a moment, because that's such a great quote, and actually that sort of the story of your life and kind of how we got here, right? So. True. Yeah, I just think it's like stupid to fucking... Anytime I'm nervous, like doing an interview or meeting people or anything like that, I just think that other people were probably nervous too, mm. doing the same shit. So I'm like, why would I be nervous too? That's embarrassing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I don't know. I just think it's always better to be different. And also your story about, again, growing up in that town where, where people were trying to put you down and talk to you because they didn't like the way that you were acting. Ultimately, it worked in your favor because, uh, uh, you know, 100 100%. million people can't be wrong, right? And exactly. <laughs> so the new record just came out February 10th, Drowning. It has some amazing tracks on it. And I, I honestly have a, such an incredible future ahead of you. I'm excited to see you play. So I'm going to come out to one of these shows, coming oh, up yay. with some of my buddies that you work with. And thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having and, me. And rest the voice, because tonight's the big show at the Mercury Lounge. I'm going on vocal rest. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. <laughs> thank you.